Thank you so much, guys. Hard to recover from that one. Thank you. Shoo. Thank you, worship team. Can you appreciate the worship team? Like, It's my favorite song. People do it for me all the time. It's my favorite song to come up to. Sometimes it's hard. You guys couldn't have done that one any better. <laughs> You know, there, we wouldn't have nothing if it wasn't for him. Like, God made us. He's, we're his intention. We're his purpose. Like, God created man. Who believes that? Like, my goodness. But he made man with intention, and he made man for his image, and he made man to be one with him and have relationship with him. Forgive me, I'm not being sarcastic or rude or negative right now. He didn't make man to be needy or selfish or grumbling or complaining or all the things we've been familiar with. That's called the fall of man. He made man in his image. He made man to walk in the light. He made man to show mercy and to pursue and make peace. He didn't make man to have animosity and need to be right and have arguments and separation and offense and division. None of that is normal to God. None of that is normal to heaven. None of that is normal to the kingdom of God. I'm just here to let you know, like, none of that is who we were ever, ever, ever created or intended to be. The, the whole point of salvation is coming out of darkness into light. It's not getting your name in a book to go to heaven that doesn't stop there. It's coming out of darkness into light. Nothing else is Christianity, nothing else ever has been, and nothing else ever will be. It's about you being in the world and nothing to do of the world. It's about you not being conformed to the world, but actually transformed because you think different now. Not transformed because you tried harder, transformed because you see different. This is Christianity. Look, I got this little window of time this morning called Sunday morning church. That's not what makes us Christians. That's where we get stirred up in love and good works. So they gave me a mic. Forgive me. I'm going to do my best to stir you up, convict you, take your heart out, work on it, put it back in, close things up before I leave. Amen? But I'm just telling you, like God made man with intention. In the Old Testament, he raised he raised up the Jewish people. He raised up the Israelites. And the reason he did that is so that the world through them would know him. So he gave to them covenant. They had feasts. They had traditions. They had things. But they lived in a way that was separate and sanctified, supposed to live in a way. And we see the story, and they failed miserably most of the time. It was, if you read the book of Judges, it's painful. Exodus is painful. There's a time in the, in the, in the, in the whole Exodus where <laughs> he said to Moses, it's like he said, mark my words, Moses. It, Israel was failing terribly. And he said, mark my words, Moses, as surely as I live, the whole earth will be filled with my glory. What he's talking about is there's going to be a people. I know it doesn't look like it. I know they're not fulfilling what I raised them up for. But there is going to be a people that will know me and know my name and bear witness of my name. And they will manifest me, which is my glory, till the whole earth is filled with the knowledge of the Lord. I believe with all my heart he was talking about Christians in Christ filled with the Spirit of God. I, I believe he raised up the children of Israel as a type and shadow of what he intended man to be and what he was about to do through a resurrected son. We have to be careful that we don't get tricked into just making this about us and what we get from him instead of what we become because of him. Because that's the difference. If it's just what you get from him, you'll still think you have reason to be discouraged, complain, not have enough, or not have anything when the whole time you have him. This is what I've read. If I know the love of Christ, I am filled with all 
the fullness of God. That doesn't sound like lack. Are you hearing me? So I'm just here to stir you this morning. God wants a people that are separated and sanctified, that understand it's more than what he can do for them. It's how he can keep molding and shaping them to make them more like him so they can walk in the light as he's in the light. This whole gospel is about us manifesting the image of God. The whole gospel, you put off the old man, Colossians 3, and his deeds, and you put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to or in agreement with the very image of the one who created him. We behold in a mirror, 2 Corinthians, and we behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into that same image even by the glory of the lord amen or the spirit of the lord second peter second peter yeah second peter one listen to this we have exceedingly great and precious promises by which through them we get full vats and barns partake of his divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through self-centered seeking. The biggest tragedy on the planet is when Christians continue to remain self-centered. Fight one another, argue one another, contend with one another, don't have enough and have the ability to even get mad at God because things didn't go the way they prayed. Please hear me loud and clear. I'm not mad, I'm crying out. Please hear me loud and clear. None of that is Christianity. It never has been, and it never will be. Christianity is sanctification. It's new life through Jesus Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's a species of being that we haven't seen yet, that hasn't even existed yet. It's new. I can't bring new wine into something that's old. It will never contain. It will spill out and leak, and I will be dry. The gospel is he has anointed my head, and my cup runneth over. That doesn't sound dry. So nobody's drinking out of my cup. I can never get drained. I can never get exasperated. I'm not growing weary and well-doing. You're playing in my splash, splashing in my saucer at best. There's overflow. Isaiah said it this way. He fills the thirsty and floods the dry ground. Thirsty for what? Thirsty for him. Thirsty for more of him. Thirsty for the understanding of his heart, his will, his nature, his person, his purpose. Why? So I can walk in that light just like, not somewhat like, just like he's in the light. I know you're hearing me because I'm mic'd up, but are you hearing me? I'm here to encourage you. If you were the enemy, you would know the word too because Satan knows the word. So... If we're to walk in the light as he's in the light, and he heard Jesus tell us we're the light of the world. No, no, put yourself in Matthew right now, and this is Jesus. I know Jesus is in me, but I'm not Jesus, but he is in me. But take me out of the picture right now, and let's just put the Lord himself here. And he says to you, you, my little children, are the light of the world. That means you're the hope of God that the world knows him. He's brought us that into it and made us that involved. It's that intimate. He's personal. He's not impersonal. He doesn't have a remote with your name on it. He gave you a heart and a will and emotions and a soul. And he showed you who he is through his son to show you his first love so you see it and love him. If you were the enemy and you heard Jesus talking to us, you're the light of the world. So let your your city set on a hill and you can't be hidden. So let your light so shine before who? Men. So they see your life, your good works, and glorify the Father. If you were the enemy, what would you do? You'd care less if they go to church. 
You'd just make sure they don't shine. You'd make sure they have some old attitudes, some unforgiveness, some offense, some he said, she said, well, I feel, well, they shouldn't have, well, that hurt, well, how come they, well, that ain't fair. He'd just make sure you live in the old while you sing about the new. And he'd make sure that you find your identity through what you're a part of instead of what you've become. And he'd make sure that you go to church, even serve in a ministry and feel spiritual and do your daily devotion, but not manifest his nature in his heart in every time of need. That you'd take account of a suffered wrong instead of no account. That you'd remember it instead of release it. And that your heart would be hurt instead of whole. If you were the enemy, that's exactly what you'd do. You would let them go to church and find their identity in what they do for God instead of who they've become because of God. Because if that latter would be the truth, we would have so much peace in our homes. We wouldn't give up on each other. We wouldn't fail each other. We wouldn't have expectations on each other. It would cancel animosity, and we would be absolutely a phenomenal shining light in a perverse generation. Let your light so shine. Well, you don't know my spouse. I'm not talking about your spouse. I'm talking about you and your light. Well, you don't know what I've been through. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what he's been through to give you this hope, to give you his spirit. See, if we continue considering ourselves, we'll never be found denied and living for him. The key is when you have faith and do that, it's not about being insensitive. I don't care what you're going through. What you're going through, you will see different. And it won't be about you and how you feel and what you're going through because your whole goal is to manifest him in the moment. It's not about, we hear a lot about emotional abuse. It's real. I wish it wouldn't happen. Unfortunately, it does. But here's the raw truth about emotional abuse. You can only emotionally abuse someone who doesn't know who they are. Try to emotionally abuse me. It's not going to happen. You'll get emotionally abused. Because I know who I am, and I know why I'm here. And that doesn't make me arrogant. That doesn't make me, that makes me understand. And we're destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So we take things personal instead of the gospel personal. And then we don't seek first the kingdom of God. We seek the answers to prayer. We seek him to put out a fire, to change the disposition of a supervisor. We seek things that benefit us instead of change us. See, because where the kingdom's concerned, it's not your boss that's the problem. It's you not understanding the Christ in you and manifesting him in front of your boss. So now you get another job because you can't stand this job, but you're going to run into the same thing here because nothing's changed in the way you see after four attempts at that, you're going to wonder why God is punishing you. Yeah. And what you did wrong to deserve this. Come on, I've been 29 years saved and a pastor for 27. That language is predominant. All about me. we got to get rid of it. I'm not saying that's you. I'm saying never let it be you. I didn't come here to judge you. I came to cheer you on. And say, man, we are the mightiest people on the earth in the Holy Ghost. If we surrender and understand, makes you untouchable. It's like nothing can get in here because he's here. And I'm alive for one reason, to shine. I'm alive. I woke up this morning to be more like him. And it makes you so free. If you'll take that step of faith, it'll make you so free. You'll be so free. Everything changes, and you see people different. Come on, you're from Florida. You know this. What happens in the morning when you take one of them big sun kiss oranges and put it on your little potpourri, ridgy thing and get all that juice and slide open the, the pulp trough, and you drink that? It's, what kind of juice is it? It's orange juice. It ain't apple. If you did that with a big old orange went, and it was apple, you'd, you'd spit it because you know it's an orange. And you'd be like, what? You'd call your friend. They'd say, what were you drinking? It'd be very weird if you squeezed an orange and got apple juice. Why isn't it weird when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? That should be so weird. But 
The enemies learned, I'll just squeeze them. I don't care how loud they sing. I don't care how full the seats are. I don't care how long the prayer time. I don't care how intense the worship. I'll make sure I squeeze them, and I'll find out who they really are, what they understand, and what they're committed to. And I'll prove that they're really not for him. They just need him. I'm going to show you some scripture that's very sobering. Okay, are you all right? Can you tell I'm not mad? Can you tell I'm not mad at you? I'm cheering you on. He paid an amazing price for this. He loves us so much, I don't think we've seen it. Like on our darkest day, he didn't change his mind about any of us. It's not so we can go to heaven when we die. It's so we can get separated from the darkness and get empowered to live in the light and make the most of now. And so we live as pilgrims and sojourners and pass through the earth seeking a homeland and sow as many seeds as we can along the way and grab as many as we can and put them in the line on the way to him. Yeah? It ain't about getting through your day, I promise you. It ain't about Nebuchadnezzar. It ain't about his fire. It's about not bowing to what's not Lord. Are you with me? Come on, man. We can, this, we can have peace in our homes. You don't have to have animosity. It doesn't have to be he said, she said. We don't need to do all this counseling in our homes if we would just die to ourselves and truly live to him. People say, well, yeah, but people have their stuff. No, people don't have to have their stuff. Where did we get that? Find that in your Bible. Ask Jesus if that's true. Well, yeah, but we all have our moments. No, that's why you have yours. You have permission for it. I don't have that permission. I'm not going to have those moments. I didn't wake up to be loved by you. I wake up to love you and manifest him to you. I didn't wake up to need you or you're going to hurt me. I found my identity in him. I'm not finding it through you. I don't find my value through you. The only way I need you is to lock arms so we can run this race together and cover the world with his glory. I never need you to find myself. I never need you for my identity, for my acceptance, for my belonging, for my value. I found myself in him. In him, I'm complete. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and I'm complete in him. And beware, lest any man cheat you through philosophy, empty deceit, or the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. I found myself in him, and that's why I'm a maniac. That's why I'm aggressive. That's why I'm aggressive, because I used to live crushed. I used to live insecure. I didn't even like me, and I needed you to like me to even believe I could be likable. And I needed support. I needed encouragement. I needed to feel valued, and I didn't get half of the stuff on the list. And I was an insecure, self-centered mess that had no value. And then he came. I saw your shirt, girl. That's what happened. But... God, he came, ah, he came, yeah, and he pulled me out of that rut and that lie and that fleshy mess, that tit for tat, he said, well, I feel mess, and I put off the old, and I put on the new, and he saved my life, (laughs) and what'd he do? He put his life in me. And I get it, people. Look, do I look calm to you or do I look like a maniac? I probably look like a maniac. I've been saved 29 years. Don't tell me it grows old. It gets worse. Because you have more history, more experience. You've been done wrong more. You have a thousand reasons to be something else. And you don't know anything else because you have a single eye. And your whole body is flooded with light because you found out he's not a way, he's the way. And many, many are on the road to destruction. But narrow is the way to life. And few are those that actually ever step in and find it. Scripture. Millions go to church. But few find the narrow way. What's the narrow way? He's not talking about Jesus and getting to God. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about walking out the life. The narrow way is deny yourself and never again make it about you. 
Stuff your feelings. Don't deny them. Stuff them with truth. Crush them with truth. You're not in denial. You're not feeling one thing, saying another. You don't know how to feel the other way anymore because you see different. You don't take offense because you see different. You know nobody owes you anything. You understand people have weaknesses and people make mistakes. You're bigger than that now. It's not about you. If God made us for his image and God's that way, can't we be that way? If Jesus said, follow me, is it possible? If he said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe? I wonder what we believe. Let's just go after God and believe him. Because if he said, I can live this way, I can live this way. The biggest critique I've ever gotten in my life, the biggest critique is people listen to me and say, you can't live that way. It sounds good on paper, but it's impossible to live. Well, you're right. The Christian life is impossible. Why don't you yield to grace and let grace make it possible? Because with God, all things are possible, and all things are possible to them that believe. But you see what happens? The enemy's tricking us into not believing, to compromise, and fall into that beware, lest you be cheated by philosophy, empty seat. And all of a sudden, you're thinking in that line, and you're weighing our experiences, and you're looking at the history of life and all of a sudden you're suppressing grace because our experiences are truth that's not correct he's the truth and his grace is greater than what we've been are you hearing me if he says come out of darkness into the light it's possible if he says put off anger then it's possible yeah he says Don't be unaware of the enemy's devices and giving no place. Don't ever let the sun go down on your wrath is where he says that. See, that's not taking ownership of your heart motive. And all of a sudden you go to bed a little hurt. Now you wake up different. You never deal with the hurt. Now you're a little insecure. Now there's a person in your life that has a loud voice. Three weeks later, you wonder what in the world's happening to your soul. Six months later, you're in counseling and don't even know how you got there. You see what I'm saying? This stuff isn't evil. It's not intentional. and It's not even hypocrisy. It just sneaks up on what we haven't surrendered. It just sneaks up on what we haven't surrendered. And the biggest lie is we call it normal. And we say, yeah, but everybody's living that way. Everybody goes through that. Everybody does that. And you ask Jesus if that's true. It's only the fall of man that introduced us to that way of living. He has never spoken the language. We have never learned one word of it from him. And he's a good teacher, but he never taught us that. So if he didn't teach it, where did it come from? If he didn't manifest it, where did it come from? Look, I could get it. I could get it if he's carrying the cross to Golgotha, and they're smacking him and hitting him and spitting on him, and all of a sudden he says, that's enough. Look, I don't even know how I made it this far, God. These people are a bunch of idiots. Are you kidding me? I mean, I know it was all forewritten, and I know it was all scriptural, and I was all planned that I'd make it to the cross, really spiritual, lamb slain before the foundation of the world, but this is too much, okay? I've healed their sick. I've cleansed their lepers. I've raised their dead. For heaven's sakes, Barabbas, are you kidding me? He kills a man. I raise the dead. He causes conspiracy. I'm trying to make peace here. And these people want to hit me, the Son of God, their Savior? I don't think so, and I'm finished. He never taught us that. But it's amazing how we've thought that, and that's all we've known, and it makes a great talk show, and people turn in and get engaged. Ain't that something? You say, well, he can't do that. He's Jesus. He can't do that. He's love. If he can't do it because he's Jesus, you can't follow. If he can't do it because he's love, you're in. Because God made us for his image, and God is love, and man's on the earth to love. Not need it, be it. Big difference. Most of us are just craving love, needing love, needing to fit in, needing acceptance. That's why we say we fell in and out of love. Ain't no such thing. Read your Bible. Love never fails. It doesn't seek its own. Takes no account or keeps no record of wrong. Then why are we busted up by the people we say we love? Because they're the people we need to find ourselves, and it's backwards. You find yourself through him so you can actually see clear and have a healthy relationship. I love you most of the time means I need you. And we prove it by the way we fall out and separate. Now, if you've lived that way, don't get condemned by this. Just go, duh. Wow. I see that. 
Oh, my goodness, I want change. And let God redeem your heart, your life, your motives, and put whatever you've done in the past aside and start living Christ from today on. That's what's possible in the mercy and goodness of God. None of this is about condemnation. None of this is about where you've been. None of this is where you divorced four times, you divorced twice, or you even divorced at all. No, 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 it's not that. Have you let go of people? Have you given up? Have you made other people your reason and your excuse for not looking like Jesus? Come on, that's all deception. We need to see that, take ownership, throw it away, ask for mercy and forgiveness, and come out of this thing clean and go after God with all our hearts. You know what happens? People see repentance. People see people change. Even hearts get restored and renewed. I preach this way everywhere I go with a loud shout. I can't even tell you anymore how many marriages I've bumped into that were legally divorced, found me on YouTube, texted a link to their former spouse, got together crying, what have we done, and got restored. Saying, if I knew this when we, I would have never, oh my gosh. I've lost count of the testimonies of that nature. Unfortunately, most of the people that do that, by the time they get back to them, even if it's six weeks, they're already with a significant other. Did you notice when people split, they're with a significant other within weeks? There's a reason. Because you ain't ready for a significant other when you just come out of a 15-year marriage divorce. We're meeting needs, people. We're meeting needs. I was standing in the living room of a lady whose husband was in the arms of a woman as we were speaking. And she said, since he's doing this, is it okay like if I would date? Or I said, what are you talking about? It just grieved my heart because I've watched so many people live there. People were more than that in the Holy Ghost. We are not trying to make it and get by. We have already won and we're in Christ and he's in us. And the reason is we're not stepping into our purpose. We're stepping into blessing. We're stepping into provision. We're stepping into protection. And oh, we have a prayer list. But I think we're not stepping into purpose. We've been going to church for generations. And I think we can have much more impact on the world if we become love. And if they see us not offended, if they see us not angry, if they see us not giving up and quitting and getting hard hearts, and they actually see us different, it just might get somebody's attention. Somebody might actually just walk up to you without you feeling pressured to evangelize. Might actually just walk up to you and say, man, can we talk? I don't get your attitude and how do you live the way you do? Because I saw what happened and I saw how you responded. What's up with that? Evangelism might just come to you. I was at home one day and my supervisor called. My supervisor called. On my day off, mealy mouth, backwards. I said, what's going on, man? He said, I'm so sorry to call you in the office. I said, are you kidding? It's fine. Why'd you call, man? Just get to the point. It's good. Well, I don't understand why you live the way you do. I don't get your life. I don't understand it. And he said, I know you're going to say it's Jesus, but I don't understand. He called me. My life was evangelistic. My supervisor, one of like four I had. I said, you got a minute to come over to my house? Can you come to my house? He said, yeah, I can. We sat on my front porch, I explained Jesus, he wept and got born again. Supervisor, never, never evangelized, didn't hand him a track, just lived Jesus, walked in the light, and he's going, this is different. And then he sees consistency, and weeks go by, months go by, and he goes, this is real. Sounds like Philippians 2, do all things. How many things? Without grumbling or complaining, so that you're seen as harmless, innocent children in the midst of a twisted, self-centered world whom you, that you are seen without fault in the midst of a twisted, self-centered world. Did you hear that? Seen without fault. Well, that's impossible, brother. Take that up with the Holy Ghost. He wrote it. You see how presumptuous we are? Do you see how we let our human experience dictate what's possible through the Word of God and the Spirit of God? That we can live without fault. Well, that's impossible, brother. Nobody's perfect. Take that up with the Holy Ghost. He said without fault. He didn't say perfect. He just said without fault in their sight. That means a proper attitude, a proper response, walking in the Spirit and living in wisdom. Galatians 5, what do you do with this? If I live by the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Well, that's impossible, brother. No, that's unbelief. Take it up with the Holy Ghost. He wrote it. Beware, beware, lest any man cheat you through philosophy 
empty deceit, just the basic principles of life, and not according to Christ. Beware, at least you be cheated. How's that for straight word? He got born again on my porch. So amazing. I'm back in the back aisle. Guy comes around the corner. Can you pray for me? I'm like, really? You want me to pray for you? Man, I'm so touched by your life, and my life's such a mess. And he's looking around, making sure nobody sees him. He's not quite at that bold place. So he wanted to go out through the side door and stand on the back porch, close the door, and pray for him on the side door. And I permitted it. I could have been hard-hearted, you know, and hardcore and said, you're standing right here. You're not going to be ashamed of Jesus. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. (laughs) But I met him where he was, took him on the back porch and put my hand right on his heart and just believed God would do something. Why is he coming to me? Because he sees my life. He sees my attitude. He sees my responses. He sees how the bosses were taking advantage of me because they were taking me as a yes man. He saw how I was in a union, so they'd give me the dirty jobs and the tough jobs. And I'm thinking, I'll do it. I'm here to work. I'll do it under the Lord. Why does the bottom man have to take all the garbage all the time? That sounds like too much. I'll take it. And then my coworkers were like, you're making a bet on us. You shouldn't be taking that job. You should be bumping it down. And I said, I don't know that I should be bumping it down. I think I can just do the job. Why has it always got to fall on Lenny, man? Like, he's the bottom guy. He gets all the garbage. I'll take this. I don't mind. Well, that's going to make it bad for us. Sooner or later, they're going to give us all those, give us all of us guys those jobs. You see who they're thinking about? So the bosses were creating it, laughing, and they're seeing me as passive and a pushover. But in the long run, I can't even, I can't even remember how many of my guys got saved. I can't even remember how many of them got saved. I can't even remember. They let me start a Bible group. We, we were taking communion. I'm laying hands on my coworkers for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ugh. I go upstairs the day I got saved. The next day I went to work. I got saved. I went to work. I got upstairs, met the head man of the whole plant, and I handed him a personal check. I wrote it out for $700. I said, you have to forgive me. I'm being honest and confessing to you. I've been pilferaging. I've been eating stuff in the racks that were open, and I was doing things I should have never done as an employee. I've been dishonorable, and I feel like this will well compensate what I've cost this company. And I know to you in a big company, it doesn't look like much, but it's much to my conscience. And if you'll receive it, I can just pay off this debt and just close it. And if you don't want me on staff anymore, on team, I get it, but I'm just confessing. I've eaten stuff that I didn't, shouldn't have ate. I mean, when the power would go out, we'd run to the crab meat section, strip off a lid and gorge a pound of crab meat as fast as you could in the dark on a storm. And the lights would come on and we're all standing there. And we'd go running. You can't get rid of crab meat smell. Supervisor comes over, there's four cans open and there's four of us standing there talking and we all stink like crab. Crab doesn't stink, but... We smell like crap. And we're like, no, we don't know who was over there. I handed him $700. I said, I want to make right and confess to you that I've done wrong. And if you terminate me, I totally understand. But I will tell you, I'm ready to be an employee under the Lord for you. My head guy is sitting there with total tears in his eyes to where he has to get something to get him out of his eyes because now they're running. And he says, Dan... I can't tell you how excited I am about this. I'm a spirit-filled Christian man. I've been praying for you guys like you have no idea. He said, you're the fruit of my prayers. God bless you. The last thing we're doing is getting rid of you. And he pushed my check to me and said, keep your check. It's all good in the Lord. Oh, it's just fun stuff. And he said, why don't you get the guys encouraged? Why don't you do a little Bible study? You could do it. And I said, can I do it? He said, do it. I'm telling you this on purpose. There was 11 people that came out of the woodwork. I told this last night. Coworkers that confessed to going to church. And when they told me they went to church, it was hard for me to not sin. Like, what? <laughs> you go to church? <laughs> Because I'm thinking, why? We tend to do things that have the form of godliness, but it lacks the power. We do it because we think service, we don't live for him, we live through him. And, And we think what we're a part of is who we are. We think that's what we get credited for. We get recognized for Christ. We're the body 
of Christ. You get it? I want to show you something. Wow. You guys okay? Just here to stir you up. Just here to cheer you on. There's nothing I'm preaching that we can't live. There's nothing I'm preaching that's not scriptural. The number one way to get there is you have to want to. I've learned even in small rooms over the years, there's a lot of people that aren't there. They don't really want to become love. They want to hold on to the rights that Adam gave them instead of deny their self and love not their own life unto death. We've been so brainwashed into it's all about me, even though we sing it's all about him. If it's really all about him, you're not offended. You're not insecure. You have no identity crisis if it's really all about him. If you're living for his glory and not your gain, you have a totally different response in life. If it's actually all about him and his glory, if you're a Christian for you and your sake, it'll become evident in adversity. Are you with me? Go to Romans 5, verse 1. We'll do it that way. I had three scriptures bombarded me, so I was buying time and listening. You don't know what I'm doing up here. No, I was buying time. I had three scriptures bombarded me, and I didn't know which one I was. So I just was buying time and listening, and I know it's Romans 5, 5, 1. Amen? And you don't even have to believe me. I know that happened. <laughs> okay. He's ending chapter 4. He's talking about Abraham. It was accounted as righteousness, as faith, right? You guys know the story? Yeah. And it's kind of amazing in Romans 4, just in case people are for some reason deceived and feeling condemned or guilty about their past or their life. Be honest, I'm not saying you're struggling right now, but who's struggled with regrets, the past, the life, shame, guilt, or condemnation since they've been a Christian at some level? Anybody be honest and raise your hand? Let me see that. Okay, this would be good news for you. Romans 4 says that Abraham's the father of our faith. It says that he, against hope, found a place to have hope that was confident. He was confident and that he became confident that God was able to perform what he promised and that he didn't waver. And it's a section of scripture that people use. Uh, you can actually look at it quick. I'll touch this because I see I have some time to do it. So uh, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Look at verse 17. I've made you a father of many nations. And in the presence of him who he believed. This is God. This is Abraham who gives life to the dead and calls those things that be not as other. Who knows the story, right? Everybody knows the story, right? He says, you're going to have a son. You're going to be the father of many nations. And at your age, you're going to have a son. He's going to be the son of promise. And Sarah, it's your wife, Sarah, going to bring forth his son. He's going to be yours. And he's like, what? Yeah, you know the story? And he gives him, he, he puts him in a vision. It's where he lays the meat out and the smoking and he walks through the meat and cuts covenant with Abraham in 15. And then by 17, it's just the whole, you ought to read it. I don't have time to go into it all. It's amazing. And here, Paul's talking about it. And he says, this guy's like in his 90s. They think it was maybe 13 years or something that he had the promise before he had Isaac, maybe. He had the promise way back in like 15. And he has Isaac in chapter 20 or 21. And I don't know how much time that is, but it's a long time. But contrary to hope, verse 18, look at this. Contrary to hope, in hope he believed. And he became a father of many nations according to what God spoke. So shall your descendants be. Now look at verse 19. This is an amazing testimony for Abraham. Not being weak in faith, he didn't consider his own body. It was already dead. He was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. That's amazing, guys. That's an amen all the way through. Like, like faith people use that for an example of faith. But when I go to Genesis and look at the story, I don't see any of that. 
I see him waver. I see him question. I see him sleep with a maidservant and take her as a wife. I see Sarah say, you know what? This ain't working, Abe, and it's a trial, you know. I mean, I'm 90-some. To crawl in that hut with you and try to get this done is work, buddy, and it ain't working. You probably ought to go into her and have a baby with her. Perhaps God will fulfill the promise through her. That's all compromise. That's all weak in faith. That's all unbelief. But the Romans writer doesn't tell it that way. And it sounds like the Bible is contradictory. Not at all. Because what Abraham did, and I don't think he fasted and prayed about Hagar. I think he said, what? You want me to go into her? Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> They're so promiscuous in the Bible. These men got, they're, they're just that way from the beginning. Don't think that's the way it's got to be because it wasn't that way in the beginning. So he goes into Hagar and Ishmael. Chapter 17, God says to Abraham, after all this happens, he says, Abraham, stand before me. This is what he says to you and me in Christ. I'm talking to people that struggled in their past with guilt, condemnation, shame. Watch this. He says, stand before me and be righteous. In other words, I'm telling you, stand before me and be right in my sight on my account. I'm making that possible. He knows where he's been. He knows what he's done. He's understanding Ishmael's there. He's not blind. Stand before me and be righteous. Reiterates the covenant, reiterates the promise, reiterates everything that he wants to do. And in the middle, Abraham cuts him off and says, oh, that Ishmael might stand before you. He said, not a chance. He's the son of your flesh. It's going to be the son of promise. And I'm telling you, it's going to go down this way. And then he comes with three. It's three men come. I wonder who that is. Three men come. And he says, oh, my goodness, the Lord. He says, Sarah, whip up some food. She's back there working. They sit down. They're breaking bread. He says, he says in, the, in the time of the month of the season, Sarah's going to conceive. She's in the back going, what? Me? I'm going to find pleasure in my age? I don't think so. Ha, ha, ha. You know the story. He says to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah said, I didn't laugh. So the woman done laughed and lied in the presence of God in a 60-second moment. That is not a good day. Then how could she be on the list of the patriarchs of faith in Hebrews 11, and how can it say Sarah, by faith, received strength to conceive? When all I saw was she laughed and she lied. How can Abraham have this testimony in Romans when all I saw is backpedaling and compromise? Because somewhere after Genesis 17, when he said, stand before me and be righteous, that's your and my conversion through the blood of Jesus Christ. He rules his kingdom with a scepter of righteousness. It's the power of God unto salvation, for in it righteousness is revealed. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yeah? What happened? Abraham in his heart went, oops. Wow, should not have done that. Ain't going to happen again. I get it, Lord. I'm locked in. And because of the blood of Jesus in Romans, see, in the Old Testament, before the blood, you see his weakness. In the New Testament, after the blood, all they record is his faith. There's no condemnation in that, is it? Because that's from the Lord. In the Old Testament, all you see of Sarah is laugh and lie. In the New Testament, through the blood, she's on the list of who you and me should be like. That even though we laughed and lied, we ought to let our hearts repent and change and say, look, we're done laughing. We're done lying. We're into believing God, and we're going to bring forth fruit, and we're going to bear fruit unto God. So the Old Testament remembers their sin, and the New Testament remembers their repentance and their change, and it records it for eternity, and better yet, the, the New Testament doesn't even mention their sin. Why? I'll remember your lawless deeds no more. That's why it's crazy 
Even though it seems rational, it's crazy for any Christian, once they're a Christian, to be guilty, condemned, and ashamed. You should be rejoicing and declaring new life and thanking God you're free and that you're different instead of living by feelings, emotions, memories, and flashbacks and thinking you're always bound and always need prayer. No, it's called faith and trusting God and the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Phew. So fun. The gospel's so fun. Oh, that we believe the gospel. Good tidings of... I'm not being rude. I'm not talking to you. But did you notice that there is a lack of great joy? There might even be lack of basic joy. But there is definitely a lack of great joy in the body of Christ because if anybody's walking in it, the rest of the people are trying to figure out what they're trying to prove, gain, if they have need, if they're looking for attention. And if somebody has great joy, it ain't like that. Ain't nobody can be like that. Because we ain't finding our joy from our salvation. We're trying to find joy through the circumstances of our life, and it's impossible. So most people are only as good as it's going. So who they are and how they are is defined by how it's going. That's why when you ask every Christian across the board, it seems, how it's going, they tell you their biggest trial, biggest dilemma, biggest setback, and say, keep me in prayer. Because we identify our lives by life instead of the giver of it. And we've stepped out of why he's in us. And somehow we're trying to get by instead of shine. Come on, that's just straight. That's not a riddle. You can't not hear that. You know, I've asked a long time ago, Lord, if you're going to let me stand in front of this many people and preach, please do something for me. Give me the ability to communicate and to speak so a child could hear. Like when I'm finished, let a person say, I hear what you're saying, and I want that. Or I hear what you're saying, I just don't want it. But don't let anybody leave and say, what's he trying to say? And I don't think you're saying, what's he trying to say? Because it ain't a riddle. It's a child can hear what I'm saying. I went so long in a church one time, a little seven-year-old girl right there where that empty seat is. She jumped up in the second row, right where that empty seat is. She leaped up. I said, I said, oh my goodness, I saw this clock and it wasn't there the whole night. I didn't see it. I was blinded to it. You say, oh, preacher. No, I'm telling you, it was a big cafeteria clock and I should have seen it. I thought the sound men took it down because I referenced time earlier. I thought they took it down. Sometimes they'll do that to be silly. And then I thought, hey, this ain't even funny. We better put it back up. I preached for three hours and six minutes and never hardly took a breath. I'm preaching. That sounds impossible, but you'd had to been there. I said, oh my goodness, is that the time? Has that clock been there? And they're like, the whole time. But I didn't see it because we weren't finished. And I said, oh my goodness, I have to stop. And the little girl sitting right there leaped to her feet and said, no. I said, no. I mean, leaped to her feet, distressed, no. I said, honey, no, I've been preaching for hours. The man sitting right where you are, pastor, three hours, six minutes, I have it recorded. I said, I've been preaching three hours and six minutes. How old are you? She said, I'm seven. I said, seven years old. I've been preaching three hours and six minutes. You should be tugging your mom's arm saying, is this guy ever gonna be quiet? I'm ready to go home. She said, oh no, sir. I get so much out of what you say. Seven years old. You have to want him. You have to want him, not just his blessing. You don't just want what he does for you. Anybody can need him, but who loves him? Anybody can need him. And the devil's convinced, read the book of Job, the devil's convinced none of us love him. We all just need him. And you let something go wrong, their true colors will shine. And they'll curse you to your face. They'll be discouraged. They won't be in worship. They'll be complaining and mad and angry because ain't nobody on the earth righteous. You read the book of Job. The devil got man figured out after several thousand years. He's sure. You better make sure he ain't right when he's talking. Yeah, ooh, that's quiet. Not being mean. Sobering. That's sobering. That's, that's to make us think. That's to make us think. Watch this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, watch this, this is amazing. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who knows that's incredible? 
that we actually have peace with God, that now he's approachable. We can be unveiled in our face and we can come to him boldly, seeing we have a high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, Hebrews 4. Who knows this is incredible? Okay, so it sounds like he's shifting gears and ramping as he's preaching. Watch. He says, we've been justified by faith, having peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-oh, second gear. Through whom now we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, that's a mouthful, but if you look at it, that's powerful, and it's saying a lot. I want you to see if this, it's up, obviously up there. I see you all looking at the screen. Oh, yeah, it's right here. So watch this. The glory of God. Guess what the glory of God is? Any manifestation of him, any realized, seen, or manifest attribute of God is the glory of God. The Christ in us is the hope of the glory of God. The Christ in us is the hope of making God seen, known, and realized. This grace we stand in is in hope of God being seen, known, and realized. Watch. Grace is in mercy. Grace is empowerment. Grace is God's ability. Grace is God's hand and strength working in your life to make you what you could never be on your own. Grace isn't, you don't say, boy, I blew up on my wife this morning. Thank God for his grace. No, his grace keeps you from blowing up on your wife. We call grace mercy all the time. Grace is God's empowerment. If you preach grace without transformation, you're preaching bogus grace. Grace is all about change. Grace is all about being what you could never be in your own strength. And guess what grace leads to? The manifestation of God in your life. Ain't that something? Now watch. This is incredible to me when the writer does this. He says, and not only that, do you see it? That's emphasizing. In the English language, that means he's going higher. And not only these first two things, not only that, we glory when all hell breaks loose. That was my interpretation. Maybe you didn't like it. We glory in tribulation. You see how quiet it is? Are you kidding? We don't glory in tribulation. We pray to avoid it. We pray it never happens. And when it does happen, we go into identity crisis. What did I do? What door did I open? Why is God allowing this? What's he trying to teach me? Why is he letting the devil? I've never seen a Christian glory in tribulation. I've seen them call counseling appointments. I've seen them cry. I've seen them stop praying. I've seen them get mad at God. I've seen them take sabbaticals. Look, you don't have to like what I'm saying, but it's true. I don't know who glories in their tribulation. But that's the Bible. And he's making it sound more ramped up than peace with God and access to grace. Peace with God and access into his grace. He's, he's, and not only that, he has it at least on the same list. Doesn't he? And not only that, same list. Here's the point. Remember what I said way back in the beginning? We're coming around to something. Satan could care less if we come to church. He's just going to make sure we don't shine. And when you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. And when you squeeze a Christian, you ought to get Christ. This is the principle I'm preaching off of, because when you squeeze a Christian, you get what they believe, you get what they don't understand, you get what they haven't been transformed in, and you actually get where they're living from, because you know them by their fruit. We better learn the power of this thing and understand where adversity comes from. Now, I'm going to try to teach you this before I have to quit here, and if you can get this, it's going to change everything for our lives. This isn't correction. This is trying to keep us from being deceived and getting pummeled when we never have to be. Glorying in our tribulations, you know as well as I do, people are praying for no tribulation. People are thinking that if something's going wrong in their life, they're missing something in their faith. The Bible says, don't think it's strange. Your brothers all over the world are going through the same things you're going through. Stuff is going to happen because you're in a war. And you're enlisted in the war by him. And no one enlisted in this war ever again entangles himself with the affairs of this life. So when adversity comes, its design is to break you. 
But if you live in faith, it will actually make you according to Scripture. So Satan is convinced he can discourage and break every person. One strike, two strike, three strike, you're out. They'll quit. They'll go to church, but they won't be engaged. They might stay in their Bible group, but they won't be effective and walk in the light. They'll get beat down. Their story will become them, and I got them. And even though they're born again, and even though the Spirit of God's in them, he will be so suppressed through the lack of understanding, I will win and destroy them. That's the devil. Glory in your tribulation. Look up there. Watch this so you read together. Why do we glory in tribulation? Because we know that tribulation... See, it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean you going, glory in your tribulation. Now, I'll, I'll act a little weird in this. Glory in your tribulation isn't, woohoo! I got $800 of bills and only 600 in my checkbook. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about glory and that you're in the world and not of it, and that you're in covenant and God is greater, and you never become what you're going through. You never take on the identity of your trial because you wear him. So there's always a response in him. So when you squeeze, he should come out, not you. You get it? Knowing, you better know this, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Watch. You need perseverance. Why would you need perseverance if everything was going to go good? Let me quote Hebrews 10, 35 and 6 for you. Don't throw away your confidence. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after the will of God is fulfilled, you can receive the promise. Why would I have need of endurance to fulfill the will of God if he was going to give me smooth seas? Author and finisher of our faith, let us run the race with endurance. It's all through scripture, people. This is the tough one. And don't get taken back by this. 29 years saved, I don't see people glory in their tribulation and understand what it means. Again and again and again, I see people fall apart, lose their countenance, cry themselves to sleep, get full of anxiety, and wonder what's next. And it proves, and that's why I'm crying out like a crazy man all the time. Because we aren't living what he paid for, even though we think we are. Because our responses in crisis proves that we aren't surrendered as we sing. And we haven't denied ourselves. It's actually all about what I'm going through. Are you hearing me? I'm not talking to you individually. I'm talking at large. I travel all over the country. I do 45 weekends. I've counseled thousands of people and I'm involved in tons of people's lives. This that he's saying on the board is not how we live. And I'm saying it's how we're called to live. So I'm saying, will we be convicted by this and begin to pursue these truths? Because look, produces perseverance. What's perseverance do? Character. It proves you're for real and you're surrendered and you're in. Character does what? Puts hope back in your heart. And guess what hope will do? It'll never disappoint you because God's love is poured down in your heart by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You never take on the identity of what you're going through. You always take on the identity of what he went through because that's where you find you. You're not here to make it. You're a pilgrim and a sojourner passing through. God is not here to get you through this life. God's here to reveal who he is through your life while you're here in this life. That's what it's all about. Watch, I'm being emphatic again. It's not about anything else, or it wouldn't be a single eye. If it was about anything else, it wouldn't be a narrow way. I think we've made it all about other things, and we're just entertained by the types and shadows of Bible teaching. We just think to know the Bible is to be okay. To know Him is to be transformed. Go to... 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'll be finished on time. I have a time, because it's warm out here. There's, there's no need to be here all day, and I also have a flight. It's at 2.15. I'll get there. Usually, I'm never finished anyway. I just stop. So whoever sits beside me might get the uh, rest of the story. <laughs> Oops. They might make the mistake, why were you in town? <laughs> 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 
It's so fun. It's just so fun to be free. I tell people I'm either the most whack man you've ever met or I'm free. And I got all my chips on free. We'll find out someday, but I got all my chips pushed over on the free space. Because you don't live with me, I do. And I've actually learned in Christ to love who I am. And I have no trouble looking in the mirror and it's not vanity. It's not because I'm handsome. It's because I see him. Yeah? And I just love who I've become in him. And I'm crying out to you guys to live what we're preaching this morning. To make it all about him in you, not him for you, him in you, and him through you. Because the truth is, he's always for you. The truth is, he'll bless you, our God. Yes, our own God will bless you. You don't even have to look for it. It just comes in his nature. He's a restorer. He's a redeemer. He's a provider. He will always be Jehovah Jireh. It's not stuff you even have to beg for or plead for. It's stuff that happens when you're living the kingdom. If you seek first the kingdom, all these things shall be added unto you. It's all in the word, guys. There's nothing I'm saying that's not right here. It's not hardcore. It's not hypo. It's not too deep. It's just what he paid for. Amen? So watch this. This is, uh, is eye-opening. So look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That means we were all dead. We were all separated from God. He raised Christ from the dead. Now we can be justified. We can be sanctified. We can be born again. And we can be filled with the Spirit. Life comes back into us. No longer are we a wheat or a tear, but we're a wheat. We're not a throwback fish. We're a keeper fish. We're in the live well, baby. It's a good thing, okay? And we have this in inheritance. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. And it does not fade away. So watch this. Nothing on his end will ever change this truth. He's this way. And this is who we are in his sight. Now you can walk totally away from it. You can fail to receive it. Or you could say you don't want it. But I'm telling you, this is the way it is on his end. And it's reserved for us forever and ever and ever, which means in heaven for you. Now watch this. We're kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in that last time. So we don't know quite the extent of what he is and who he is, but when we see him as he is, we will be like him, right? So look at verse 6. Now this is interesting. I'm so glad you have this up there for everybody to see. This helps the whole room. Watch this. In this truth we just read, you greatly rejoice. Because we're pilgrims, we're seeking a homeland, and he just talked about it, and it gets our hearts ramped up, and we're seeking to meet him and know that we're going to meet him. First John 3, I preached it last night, most of the church would say this is impossible, but the church, the church is, is just tricked into this, watch. He says, those who have this, this hope of seeing him that day and becoming like him, the ones that actually have that hope, purify themselves even as he is pure. Well, that... 10 out of 10 Christians say that's impossible. But yet the writer says it's what we're going to do, purify ourselves even as he is pure. And what we don't, see, we just look at Jesus and say, we've been trained by religion to say that's him, this is us. But he's called us up hither. He's called us sons and daughters. He's called God our father. He's put us in the family. He's made us one. He seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That doesn't make us something. That makes us something in him. Are you with me? Purify yourself even as he is pure. Here's what we miss. There's no level to purity. It either is or it isn't. It either has a cant to it or it's straight. There's no level to purity. You can't say we can't be as pure as Jesus because pure is pure. So we get tricked by religion to compare Jesus to us and we think we can't be pure like he's pure. But he said the pure in heart shall see God. So it must be possible to have one. Okay. In this we greatly rejoice, though now, though now, say that with me, now, right now, in this life, right? Uh-oh, for a little while. What's he mean a little while? Brief moments, light affliction compared to the eternal weight of his glory when he comes. You know when Paul wrote that? When he was being stoned and beat and left for dead and whipped and forsaken? He called it brief moments of light affliction. One of the six things he mentions in that section of, or four things he mentions in that section of Scripture, we're having a counseling appointment for. If we're going through just one of Paul's in 2 Corinthians 4, we need an appointment. 
He went through it all and said, man, I don't count my life dear. None of it moving me. It's all brief moments of light affliction when I keep it compared to what's coming when he comes. And my face says, keep on going, boy, and don't look back. Don't pick up what you call dead. Don't love your own life. Lay it all down and go after him. If you find your life, you lose it. If you lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. Paul's just cheering himself on. You get it? Come on. Do you hear how much scripture I'm giving you? That makes the eye single? Watch this. But now, for a little while, if need be, in a resting phrase surrounded by commas, if need be. Did you ever take a test in school? Did you ever fail it? Anybody be honest? I failed a math test in school because I didn't like math. I was so glad that city school only made me get two math credits. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. And I wasn't even a Christian. I'm ready to shout, thank you, Jesus. And I breezed through that math, but I failed a test. Who ever failed a test? What happened? Wow, you all failed a test. <laughs> what did we have to do when we failed the test? You had to what? Did you ever pass a test? Did you ever have to take that one again? Huh. Though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by, look at that, various trials. You know that Satan comes immediately for the word's sake, that the sower sows the word, and as soon as it's the word sowed, Satan comes immediately for the Word's sake, not your sake, the word's sake. What's this war about? It's a demon war against the kingdom of God. Darkness is somehow trying to come up with a plan to stop. He can't overpower light, so he's trying to stop light from ever shining. So he comes to your life to keep the kingdom from ever building in you. The Matthew 7 man, the wise man that heard and did, did you ever notice he had the same exact storm as the man that was foolish? It's not because he brought the storm on himself, people. It's not because he opened a door. It's just because he heard the word. The storm came to assure that the word never became flesh and life. You're going to go through stuff. Why? In various trials. Why? Next verse. That the genuineness, sincerity, the pureness, the legitimacy, the realness, the matter-of-factness of your faith, not the confession, not the woo-hoo, the genuineness where the rubber meets the road in trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, I promise you that right there is greater worship to Jesus than any song service we've ever done, even though song services are more than singing a song. I'm telling you that right there is the purest worship ever because this is the real deal. I have every reason to be something else. I don't know anything else. I'm living my life for him. And the more you squeeze me, the more it'll be proven. The more you squeeze me, the more it'll be proven. And I'm passing this test, and I won't have to take it again. You get it? I've been, in, I've been through witchcraft, tried to kill me years ago. It's never touched me again. Can't touch me. He is not running through here and running me over like a truck, or he would have by now. God will stop that, smote that. I passed that test. He said, you ain't touching that boy anymore. He surrendered, and he proved it, and you proved it. And I watched it. You're done. And he will stop him. He can't sneak up behind me. I have great confidence. I wouldn't talk like this. I'd be overrun if I wasn't correct. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that feels good to me because he's for me and not against me. And he gave me power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall harm me. For it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So don't be afraid. You get it? I'm not popping off. I'm not popping off. I'm talking 29 years of trials, demonic stuff, witchcraft. My mama's sick, my dad not right, my wife getting an identity crisis for eight years, coma, brain damage, life support, two children running crazy in their teen years trying to find out their own way. They're all back, everything's great, and we have a great testimony. We don't have a sad story. We have a great testimony of redemption in Christ. But I got to be there for it all and love not my own life unto death and be a living example to my family that yes, we can live surrendered. Yes, we can not lose heart. Yes, we can trust God. And my wife has no brain damage, and my, my, my dad got saved, and my mom died and went to be with Jesus, and, and my kids are home, and they're Christians, and we have a great family. If I didn't get what I get, we'd have never made it through that.
People don't go eight years with a struggling wife, especially when you're not having physical contact. Huh. Because men say, well, you got to get it somewhere. No, you got to get Jesus. Yeah. Being much more precious than gold, though it's perishes, test by far found the praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Give me the next verse, please. Guys, we can live this. You haven't seen him, but you love him in this situation. And now you don't see him, but yet believing. This is what I've never seen. This is what I never see, people. We got to start living this. Yet believing, we rejoice with inexpressible joy and full of glory. I don't see that when people are in trials. I see tears, prayer requests, fear, and appointments. I'm just being honest. I don't see that because we haven't understood that we're not here to survive. It's impossible to be a Christian for you. You have to be a Christian for his great name. And if you're really a Christian for his great name, that'll be found as genuine in the midst of pressure. So Satan brings the pressure to prove you're not surrendered. God lets it unfold to let you reveal your heart. He's not interested in stopping the adversity because the adversity is a tool to reveal your sincerity. It's right there. We think when stuff's going wrong, why is God letting this happen? What's he, we turn it into a parable. What's he trying to teach me? What door did I open? Instead of, wow, here's Satan trying to break me and everything I'm growing in. Might as well be the wise man. Let the storm beat on the house. The house will stand and let's keep growing. I'm going to submit to God, resist the devil. He'll flee. He'll get the idea. The more you touch me, the more you make me. You thought you could break me. You see how much of a madman I am? You see how much of a madman I am? You thought you could break me, but man, you made a madman. You made me. And there is points of no return in your life where you see what you see. And who the sun sets free is free indeed. Boy, we ought to believe that. And more than believe that, we ought to experience that and let the world see that so the world, my world might know that God sent his son. I'll close with this and never forget this. Never forget this. Jesus didn't say when we preach a gospel that sends people to heaven to every corner of the earth that he's going to come. He said it's the gospel of the kingdom and his kingdom's here and it's in you. Watch this. He said in John 17, Father, I'm closing with this. Please get this. Father, imagine Jesus. Father, he's about ready to go to the cross. He was slain before the foundation of the world for this moment. And he's about ready to go to the cross. And he said, Father, when they become one, just like we're one, then the world will know that you sent your son. Remember that, and let's live that. God bless you. Amen, amen. Come on, everybody stand up on your feet. Come on, give the Lord a praise for his word. Give the Lord a praise for his truth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You could be seated. I want our altar team to come to the front, our altar team to come to the front, and I want you to come on this side over here. And I want to give opportunity for those of you in this room that have not experienced that transformation in your life. If you hear that word and it resonates in your spirit and you say, that's not who I am. That's not who I've become. I am still allowing the influence of this world to dominate my life. I want to give you opportunity to come and respond and to pray. There may be some of you in this room right now that you were invited by a friend or you've heard about us online, but you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life and be the Lord of your life. Today is the day of salvation and tomorrow is promised to no man. Today is the day of salvation. We're gonna give just a minute for those that are rushing to, to leave, to, to, to leave just for a second. And everybody in this room begin praying right now. Begin believing right now. Transformation begins with a willing heart. Transformation begins by acknowledgement that Jesus died for my sins and Jesus gave himself for my life to be full. And if you're not experienced the fullness of that love, today is your day of salvation. And I'm going to ask you all over this room, 
if this word is stirring deep in your heart and if you know that you've been manifesting flesh you've been manifesting the works of the enemy and you have not responded to to this call before that today is your day to respond and say Jesus I want that life I want that in my heart I want to be that man I want to be the person that you died for all over the room right now if that's you and the Holy Spirit's ministering to you if you feel the conviction Dan did not preach this to condemn you he preached this so that the Holy Spirit can bring light into your heart and that you would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say I want you to live that I want you to become that I want you to receive that love and be that love all over the room, if that's you and God is speaking to your heart, could you just lift your hand and wave it to me back in the back, all over the room? Man, a lot of hands going up all over the room. Respond. Respond. It takes faith to say, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care what anybody thinks about the way I've been living. Today is my transformation day. It's the day that I'm going to respond to this love, and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to fill my life and transform me into a new image. Amen. Come on. Everybody right now, if you didn't raise your hand and you say, you know what, I need to respond to this because I want to seal it in my heart today. Could you just wave at me one more time? Wave at me one more time all over the room. Every person with your hand waved, with your hand up, would you just right now get out of your seat and come and let these ministers minister to you with the love of God. Let them pray with you and just point you to the cross and point you to the love of God. Let God transform your life. They're coming from all over. Everybody come on, stand up. Everybody turn to somebody around you and say, hey, you want to go? No condemnation in here, buddy. I'll go with you right now. Everybody turn to somebody and ask them to go with you right now and to come and allow the love of God to transform your life. It changed my life. It made me new. It took away all of my past and gave me a hope and a future. Amen. They're coming all over the room. Let people minister to you right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. They're going to pray. Everybody be seated if you could. Right in front of you are giving envelopes. They're giving envelopes for every person in this room to sow into this ministry. How many believe that this message needs to be preached to the church? How many believe this message needs to be preached to the world? Amen. I believe it with all my heart. And I am so blessed that God sent one of his generals of the faith to be with us in front of you is a giving envelope everybody grab a giving envelope if you're giving online you can give to destiny church naples through text to give you can also give on the website if you hit the little drop down box it'll say guest speaker and that giving will go to brother dan to minister to his ministry but let's pray right now and i want god to speak to your heart about sowing a significant seed into his life father god we thank you that dan has never asked this church for anything. He's never asked for a plane fare to be reimbursed. He's never asked for an offering. He's never asked for food. God, he comes with an open heart knowing, Lord God, that he has come to bring the truth of your word. And Lord, we as a church believe in him and we believe in the message that you put in his heart. And God, we want to bless him. We want to bless his family. We want to bless his children, his grandchildren. And God, through the blessing on his life, Lord, through our sowing into that, Lord, we can be a part of it and we thank you lord god for sending us dan moeller to naples florida we love him and we bless him in the mighty name of jesus amen they're going to pass giving buckets down the aisle and everybody sow something into this ministry and let god minister to you and through you come on and, and and after you've given why don't you just stretch forth to all these that have come forward to say i need that love i need that transformation because that's what we're all about here at destiny amen thank you lord thank you lord let's just worship the lord together miss gail
that you've given him, why don't you stand up on your feet with us and let's worship the Lord. that you are here today. I pray you'll live this faith every day this week and let God shine through you. Share your faith with somebody. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday, 9 and 11.30 in the sanctuary. God bless you, everybody. Because he